This episode is brought to you by my friend Rebecca Walser, a financial expert who can help you protect your wealth. Book your free call with her team by going to friendofdinesh.com. That's friendofdinesh.com. Uh, coming up, um, uh, Debbie and I will uh, do our Friday roundup. We're going to review the great Twitter blue check mark controversy when examine the prospects of a Biden re-election campaign and explore the real reason for Tucker Carlson's abrupt departure from Fox. I also want to put forward some gory body count statistics to argue the crimes of religion are infinitesimal compared with the crimes of atheism. Hey, if you're listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, or watching on Rumble, please hit the subscribe button. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. It seems like things are starting to get going for the 2024 election. Uh, Biden has announced, now Biden's announcement was sort of a non-announcement, a kind of pathetic video that he made. And in some ways, I don't even know if they wanted this to be a quiet announcement, uh, quiet in the sense that it mobilizes the Democrats' activism. It gets their fundraising going, but they don't want to necessarily put it out front. Uh, on the Republican side, Trump is certainly in the fray and um, blasting uh, away at some of the others, notably DeSantis. DeSantis, uh, Debbie mentioned to me, has set up a uh, official exploratory committee, which means that he is very seriously thinking about running. Generally, you don't do that unless you really want to get into the ring. And uh, what I want to do is is uh, call attention uh, to um, something that seems to have gone a little bit ignored, diminished by the wayside. And that is the issue of how do we fight the things the Democrats did in 2020 that they will surely do again uh, in 2024 if the Republicans haven't taken action uh, to counter them. Uh, notice that in 2022, while the Democrats didn't pursue the same exact type of election interference or election fraud, they found other ways to get the needed result. I mean, think of how someone like Katie Hobbs was able to win in Arizona. It's downright crazy. She hardly campaigned. Think of it. She was in that sense exactly like Biden. Uh, and yet her technique or strategy seemed to be different. It wasn't mules. In fact, there were patriots in Arizona looking for the mules. It looks like what the Democrats did was something kind of more simple, which is, hey, election day is when all the Republicans turn up to vote. We'll have some convenient glitches on election day. This will suppress the Republican vote and that will be enough. So this is a case where the Republican insistence, let's all vote on voting day, let's all vote on election day, no showing up for early voting really hurt us. Why? Because if you had showed up to early voting and there was a glitch in the machine, well, you know what, show up two days later and you can still vote no problem. So the Democrats banked their early vote, the Republicans held off, and this seems to have, this could very well have been the key factor costing us not just the uh, governor's race, but other races in Arizona as well. Now, when you talk about election interference, we're not, we are talking about voter fraud. That's included uh, uh, illegal ballot harvesting, um, mules, but there's also other types of interference. Think about the uh, suppression and censorship of the Hunter Biden story. So if you're able to shut down a big story relevant to the election before the election, you're keeping the American people from having the information that they need to cast an informed vote. That is a form of election interference and in some ways, even a voter suppression. Think about the way in which the Democrats changed the rules. Now, in some cases, they changed the rules with proper authority. They had either legislative backing or they were able to get the proper authorities to say, all right, we're going to uh, extend voting uh, times. We're going to install all these um, uh, drop boxes. And But in other cases, they were able to finagle the rules and uh, get uh, 
uh, people to do things that they were not authorized to do in the belief that, hey, once the election is over, it's not going to be easy to undo these things. And sure enough, that's proven to be right. Courts have been reluctant to go in and say, wait a minute, the legislature uh, said that all ballots in Pennsylvania have got to be in by election day. This idea that because it's COVID, you can send in your ballot and we're going to keep it and count it three days later is absurd. It is, in fact, contradictory and in violation of the law. And we're not going to allow those ballots to be counted. So the courts kind of looked at this sort of stuff, but then backed away. And I think all of this has given the Democrats the idea that there's no reason to call any of this off. It's It's been working. It's a scheme that is successful. And Republicans have been giving lip service. And I've heard some talk about, well, Republicans need to do ballot harvesting. But where's the indications that we are building a legal ballot harvesting operation across the country and particularly in the swing states? Where's the evidence that we're doing this in Arizona or in Georgia or in Pennsylvania or in Michigan? I mean, isn't it a fact that these same states are going to be critical in 2024? Now, in some of these cases, the ordinary citizen uh, can do some things, but not much and not most of the things that need to be done. The ordinary citizen, if you were to ask me, like, Dinesh, what can I do? Sure, I'd say volunteer, become part of the election process, become a poll observer. Just having eyes on the process is useful. And so you'd be doing, if you have the time, if you're willing to do it, this would be a noble task for you to do. But it's up to the Republican Party and it's up to the Republican legal establishment and it's up to the campaigns, the Trump campaign, eventually the DeSantis campaign. They're the ones whose fate is at stake here. They're the ones that need to jump in and create the engineer, the mechanisms that make sure that the same kind of election interference, the unleveling of the playing field, the rigging of the rules so that they benefit one party over another, whether legal or illegal, that we have ways to counter that. So we're able to expose the illegality where something is legal, we can build our own operations to do it. We stop the nonsense about vote only on election day. Uh, that may be some kind of a utopian ideal, but we got to vote and bank our votes early so that the kind of Maricopa style glitch can undo a critical race in a critical state. So all of this, the sort of processes of the election are just as important as campaigning. They're just as important as the movies I make. They're just as important as getting out the message because after all, they involve the, the counting of the votes and the mechanics of the process that is part of how the outcome gets determined. Bank failures, record inflation, spy balloons, mass layoffs. It's a recipe for disaster if your investments are with a typical financial advisor. Uh, typical financial advisors give you the same advice they've been giving since the 1980s. But my friend Rebecca Walzer is different. She's a wealth strategist. She's a tax attorney. She has a global MBA from the London School of Economics. She told her clients to get out of equities back at the end of 2021. She got it right when most advisors got it wrong. And who had to pay the price? You as the consumer and the investor. So don't let blind loyalty leave you losing money. Call Rebecca's office today to protect you your wealth from the market uncertainty and chaos. Debbie and I just did a call with Rebecca's team to talk about our investments. We're moving ahead and you should to go to friendofdinesh.com to book a call with Rebecca's team. That's friendofdinesh.com to protect your investments and your future. Debbie and I are here for our Friday roundup and we got a bunch of uh, interesting stuff to cover. We thought we'd start by talking about Twitter and the so-called blue check mark, the coveted blue check mark that once uh, signaled I'm an important person. I am officially verified on Twitter. I am who I say I am. No one is impersonating me. Uh, and uh, in fact, you and I had this conversation because <laughs> I've been verified. I had the check mark for a long time. You did. And you're like, why can't I get a yeah. check mark? I tried for years and I was like, yeah, you know, people, people did impersonate me. And they were, you know, obviously saying negative things and, and whatnot. And I was like, I need to be verified because I'm married to a public figure and you know, I'm a public figure myself. And so I need to be ver verified. And I tried, I would, I would submit my license, my passport, all kinds of things. 
and I never did get verified. So well, this was the old Twitter regime, and Elon Musk comes along, and he could have just said, "Well, listen, I'm going to create a fair process of verification so that only people who do have this kind of public figure status." But in fact, he decided to democratize Twitter itself. Basically, say, "Listen, if you want to have a confirmed identity, you want to have a blue check mark." Pay eight bucks,、uh, and then show that you're you, and you'll get it. So he opened up the blue check mark to everyone, and and it's funny is that the left is like freaking out over this and getting really annoyed, and you, their elitism, their shocking elitism, is coming out in spades. Here's an article in Slate. Now it's a disguised article. They don't want to say we're aristocrats, we're better than everybody <laughs>、yeah. else. So here's how they they frame it: How Elon Musk turned the blue check mark into a scarlet letter. So supposedly Elon Musk has made the blue check mark something negative instead of something positive. And the subtitle is a weekend long masterclass in business failure. So. You know,、I'll, the article basically says you've got these celebrities. Think of people like、um, LeBron,、uh, LeBron James, or I guess the novelist Stephen King, and they say, "I will not pay for my blue check mark." And so Elon Musk was sort of like, "Really?、Uh, all right, fine, I'll pay for you." So evidently, Elon Musk has covered the eight dollar cost of some of these celebrities, partly because it's kind of like you're such a pampered group of people, you won't even pay eight bucks. Don't you pay money for New York Times subscriptions and everything else you use? You're like spending. All this time on Twitter, you won't pay eight dollars. So you know, I was like, "Fine, it's okay. I'm richer than you. I can pay the eight bucks." So you think that a, a gesture of magnanimity on Elon's part would settle the matter? But no, they interpret this as a negative. That these people have now made it a badge of honor not to pay, and the fact that Elon is paying is kind of showing up Elon because, after all, if you're you're paying the eight bucks yourself, obviously Twitter is not going to make a bunch of money. But wait a minute. Twitter is not making money off LeBron James and Stephen King. They're making money off the ordinary citizen、yeah. who decides I'm getting a service from Twitter.、Mm-hmm. I like the verification, and I'm willing to pay eight dollars. So、mm-hmm. it's the ordinary guy's money that will, in the long term, make make a profitable source of yeah, revenue for Twitter. But it's the ordinary guy that they don't want to be like. The same with right. They don't want they, they, exactly. They feel like they're so much greater and better than the person next door that they they don't want to be verified if Joe Blow is verified. I mean, look at this line. Some people have decided to pay for blue and its check mark, which used to signify some cursory level of trustworthiness or authenticity on Twitter, but now confirms that the user has eight dollars and a cell phone. Well, wait a minute. Uh, the ordinary guy who wants his identity confirmed, who doesn't want someone to masquerade or, or be an imposter for him, he has the same right. He's just as authentic as LeBron James. So the point being here that that these guys just they want they they looked at Twitter as a private club. And they looked at Twitter as an ideological tri- private club. Yeah, maybe we'll let in Dinesh and Charlie Kirk, but no, Debbie. No, she doesn't really quite make the cut. Even though pretty much every leftist journalist earning thirty-seven thousand dollars a year, every loser at at you know salon, <laughs> you know, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying on their side, you, you had to accomplish nothing. You simply had to be like at the Sacramento Bee. I'm an associate、oh. editor. I'm verified. And so Twitter had this ideological bias, but.、Uh, yeah. I think Elon Musk has really hit their pride by democratizing the whole system, and I think it's fantastic.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I、I'm, mean, you didn't, you you were not mad about it. You'd been verified for years, and you weren't like. Oh, now I'm going to be the same as the little people. You didn't have that attitude. I mean, I pay a hundred dollars a year to get、uh, get media outlets that I look at only occasionally, and here's something that I'm on. Well, you say all、uh, the time, but certainly daily. Twenty four seven. I wouldn't say twenty four seven. No, you also say I play chess twenty four seven. I can't be doing both twenty. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's got to be one or the other. Both. Twenty four seven. Dinesh plays chess twenty four seven. Dinesh is on Twitter twenty four seven. And Dinesh and is、yeah. working. Twenty four seven. Evidently, I have a Actually, lot of twenty four. Dinesh is so smart; he doesn't need to work twenty four seven because he's on these other things twenty four seven. Anyway,、um, I, I think it's a good move by Musk. I'm happy to pay the eight bucks. And hey, if you're LeBron James or Stephen King, I think you can afford it.、Too. For years, big mobile companies have been dumping millions into leftist causes, and we kind of had to take it because another option didn't exist. Well, 
Now it does. Patriot Mobile is America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. It's helping to build a parallel economy. What does that mean? It means an economy within America in which we support our own and refuse to subsidize companies that use our money to subvert our principles and values. Patriot Mobile offers dependable nationwide coverage on all three major networks so you get the best possible service in your area without the woke leftist propaganda. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you support free speech and religious freedom, the sanctity of life, the Second Amendment, and our military veterans and first responder heroes. A Patriot Mobile's 100% US-based customer service team makes switching easy. You lose absolutely nothing by talking to these guys. Just go to Patriot Mobile M-O-B-I-L-E, patriotmobile.com slash Dinesh or call them 878 Patriot. Get free activation today with the offer code Dinesh. Ask about their coverage guarantee while you're there. Patriotmobile.com slash Dinesh or call 878 Patriot. Joe Biden is running again, believe it or not. You have a guy who can barely carry out this term. It's kind of like a runner. He's, he's having trouble finishing the race. He's gasping. You know, you're not even sure he's going to get there. And then he's like, sign me up for the next marathon. I'm ready to go. So what, what do we make of uh, this abs- well, insanity? It, and that's what it is. It's insanity. But it's insanity with a purpose because this guy wants to become president again because so many of his relatives are going to go to prison and he's not going to be able to bail them out. He's not going to be able to give them a pardon. So he has to be president. Uh, that is the only thing I can think of because this this man is... I mean, this is a really interesting theory. It is that, look, because Biden's been president, uh, so he's checked the presidential box. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, uh, you know, pushing 80, or has he turned 80 already? Or if, uh, either one or I, the I, other. In any mm-hmm. event... He'll be 82 um, right. if he runs again in is this? A, and he seems to be mm-hmm. depleted and, and exhausted and a puppet. So who wants to be that? Is that something that yeah. you would relish... So you're saying, no, he has an ulterior motive. Absolutely. His whole life is catching up with him. Absolutely. His crimes are being and, you exposed. Know, the interesting thing is that, you know, with, with this Blinken uh, thing and the 51 um, intelligence, intelligence officers. officers that have said that they kept the, the, the Hunter Biden laptop story out of the muse because they wanted him to win instead of Trump. Well, perhaps if, if, they didn't do that if they didn't go through such great lengths to like stop the news from becoming news. He could have already pardoned him. And then we wouldn't have to put up with four years of Biden again. Right. But the fact that they have delayed things, delayed matters, um, he, Biden and his family, because I'm pretty sure that it's not just Biden wanting him to run again. It's Hunter and all the other people. Uh, they're like, hey, whoa, you're not done. Remember, if they if they indict us, if we go to prison, you got to get us out of there. You know, I mean, so, I remember the scene in The Godfather where they're talking about the fact that they're really looking forward to deploying their operations out of Cuba. Now, why? Because because uh, one of the mafiosos um, says, basically, listen, we've never had a country where we could kind of do our own thing. We would be unaccountable for our crimes. We'd be working with a friendly government. And um, and um, Michael Corleone, of course, nods and goes along. Now, Biden, of course, doesn't have of he deals with foreign countries but what you're saying is it's something of the same thing because if the biden regime retains hold of the united states we become their cuba we become the quote foreign country that they can then control and their own mafia operations will never become exposed i mean they are getting exposed but there's still no accountability to this day yeah absolutely and that's why i think that we as republicans have to be very careful how we tread the water right now because you know it self imploding and 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 having all these petty acrimonious fights division. Acrimos- yeah we have to remember that we have to win this election in 24 or we really are done as a country i've been talking about the fact that we are on our way to be becoming Venezuela, but we definitely will be if we don't if we don't win this election. I mean, for many uh, election already, cycles, he's already acting like Maduro. Can you imagine another four years? Yeah, Ugh. people would say this is the most important election, 1996, uh, 2000, 2004. But I think we can see what has happened in the country just in the last three years. 
a real deterioration of basic liberties, a real breakdown of our institutions, an erosion of checks and balances that previously held together at least to some degree. The media, always biased, has now gone into full Pravda or propagandistic mode. So we're in serious problems as a country, and I think you're saying the stakes are very high. The stakes for- are very high, but li- listen to this, okay? so. So basically, you know, uh, Biden's commercials and all of that, look what it says. It's essential to remind voters of what's at stake in 2024. This is coming from from them, right? Yeah. And to do so, we have to remember the issues like abortion access. So that's key. Protecting our climate, curbing gun control, making healthcare more affordable and making our economy work for every American. I mean, you know, listening to it, it almost sounds, oh yeah, 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 I agree. But when you look at it, when when you dissect it, it's like, guys, this is ridiculous. You're talking about the extremism of their agenda, abortion for all nine months, uh, even laws that would uh, that would prevent the restriction of partial birth abortion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the climate has just become kind of a cult, yeah. uh, and it's become highly profitable not for only, people like Al not Gore. Not only that, but but some of the things that they're trying to do with the climate is going to seriously make us go back a hundred, a hundred and fifty years because we our grids are so messed up. And they don't want, you know, they they only want electricity, right? And if our grids can't take it, guess what? We're going to be in the dark. This is what they want. <laughs> so uh, Debbie's talking very about forward, repealing the industrial revolution to a degree. Very forward thinking these progressives and, are, and you've right? you got to imagine people in India and China, these other countries coming up, just laughing at the nonsense that they hear out of the Europeans and the Americans. And they're like, if you guys want to destroy yourselves, go right ahead. We're trying to come up in the world and our relative statuses are only going to improve as yours goes down. Hey, have you heard Mike Lindell and MyPillow have launched My Mattress Topper 2.0? This is going to change your sleeping habits. The new 3-inch MyPillow mattress topper is made up of three unique layers. Layer 1, MyPillow patented foam, which provides superior support and durability. Layer 2, transitional foam, which provides optimal comfort, evenly distributes body weight, and helps relieve pressure points. And Layer 3, the cover made from a special material to keep your body temperature regulated through the night. This MyPillow mattress topper is washable and dryable. It's made in the USA, comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. This includes Incredible three-inch mattress topper is as low as two hundred nineteen fifty-nine with promo code Dinesh. So go ahead, call eight hundred eight seven six zero two two seven. Again, the number eight hundred eight seven six zero two two seven, or just go to mypillow.com. But either way, don't forget to use the promo code D I N E S H Dinesh. The uh, real reason for Tucker Carlson's abrupt departure from Fox remains a little unclear, and there's a bunch of different uh, hypotheses or theories circulating. You saw one that was actually, well, here the article, this one is... Uh, well, I mean, can we really trust it? It's. It, I think it's from The Guardian. <laughs> the Guardian in, in, in Britain. Yeah. What does it say? Well, it says that Tucker Carlson's vulgar language in texts contributed to Fox's firing of him. And what's the vulgar language and who was he referring to? So apparently he was referring to Sidney Powell and some of it. He also referred to Murdoch and other uh, parts of it Um, so um, and and apparently he was just a very mean guy is what they what they were saying well uh, I can see if if he made uh, disparaging comments about Rupert Murdoch that this if it got back to Murdoch Murdoch would be upset I'm his boss that kind of thing Um, I mean it seems pretty clear that Tucker is a little bit of an earthy guy and I say this because in fact you made this point to me that when Justin B. Wells sent me very insulting texts, this was in the immediate aftermath of 2000 Mules, he was speaking in this kind of vulgar, brutish language. And I said to Debbie, I'm like, do you think that Tucker's producer would do this on his own? And she's like, well, it probably Tucker talks like that. So this is like the this is the talk around the office. And there's a woman named um, Abby Grossberg, who's apparently suing Tucker, claiming that there was all this uh, very vulgar, sexist talk going on in the office. 
who knows? I, I mean, I have seen in articles a completely different theory that has nothing to do with any of this and actually says that it's it's Tucker's Christianity. And by Christianity, what I mean is 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 not Tucker's personal devoutness or anything like that. But Tucker gave a speech at Heritage right before he got fired. And he basically said, this isn't just a political fight. He goes, this is a spiritual war. And the other side isn't just wrong. They're basically like on the devil's side. They're evil. They're on as the we evil, as we've say. said. Yes, exactly. So I thought that this rhetoric is actually um, that Tucker was saying reflected some deeper truths about our politics. There yeah. is a moral dimension. There is would, a religious but dimension. Why would Fox? That makes not, no sense, it right? It makes absolutely no sense because most of Fox's audience are Christian conservatives. And then look at the way in which Ainsley and others wear yes, their Christianity on public display. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, admittedly, Fox is, I would say, mainly about economic and foreign policy conservatism. They're not. They don't really focus on social issues, but. Even so, it seems to me implausible and a bit much to say that Tucker gave a speech, not even on Fox, this is at Heritage, and that that was a key factor. I don't think we've really gotten the full story. I mean, Fox isn't telling. Notice how little they I mean, covered the story. M my theory is that maybe perhaps even, you know, with all of the January 6 footage that he got, my theory is that perhaps because you, you know, you even you said they didn't let him like do the full on story that he complained to the powers that be. Right. And that they saw him as too much of a risk. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I think it may also be that that even though they gave him more latitude than they gave the other hosts, it was still not enough. And Tucker was like, listen, I want to be able to let Tucker be Tucker, you know, if you will. And, and these guys were like, no, guess who owns Fox? Fox. Uh, we're a corporation. You're an employee. So you do what you're told. And Tucker rankled. But I, but even given all that, honey, I think even that doesn't fully explain it. Here's why. Tucker didn't walk. Uh, evidently, what happened is there was some sort of a showdown. Tucker on Friday goes see a Monday. And then Monday comes along. And evidently, Tucker's planning his show. Yeah. Then somebody had a conversation with Tucker. And they made this rather momentous decision. You're out. Uh, Tucker then tells his staff. And essentially, his show doesn't appear on the air that day and, and or subsequently. So this appears to be a Fox decision. No, that's what I mean. But he made them mad. And that's why, you mm. know, because maybe he, maybe perhaps he was too opinionated and and too like upset about not being able to do this or that. And they're like, you know what? He's more he's more of a liability for us, even though he was making them all their money. Um, and, and he was like, you know, we survived after O'Reilly, you know. That, this is a key point. I right. think Fox thinks that in the end, people's loyalty is to Fox. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not true. I think what happened with O'Reilly was that Tucker was able to step into those shoes and create a persona that he already had, but he was able to sort of hit his own stride in that show in the primetime hour and in a sense, do better than O'Reilly. Now, Fox by thinking, well, we'll find another guy who's going to do better, better than, than Tucker. Right, right. Um, and I think that is a that is a hope rather than a, a practical well, expectation. Not only that, but I don't I really don't think that somebody can come in and do better than Tucker because they're going to m muffle them. Right. They're going right. to they're going to silence. Them. In fact, the only type so, of guy who would take that job is someone who agrees in advance to be muffled. Right. right? Because they're going to recognize, listen, muffling is part of what they do at Fox. And if you want to be unmuzzled, then you don't want to sign up for this. Tucker at least may not have known what he was getting into. But obviously, his successor knows. He knows, listen, I'm working for Fox. They're going to tell yeah. me what to do. I need to be a kind of obedient host. Uh, otherwise, I too will get the boot. You know, and maybe maybe Tucker might want to go on to do radio, maybe fill in um, Limbaugh shoes. I, I don't know. I really don't know. He what, does have there are a lot of avenues the, open to absolutely. Tucker. Absolutely. It's and, not it, it's not just, you know, I was telling you that that, you know, it, it could it could be that he could just start his own network. <laughs> Who knows? For sure, we, we do need it. Want to have a good recipe for getting rid of those aches and pains? Debbie and I started taking Relief Factor a couple of years ago. The difference we've seen in our joints, nothing short of amazing aches and pains are totally gone thanks to this 100% drug-free solution called Relief Factor. How does it work? It supports our body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor become regular customers and they order more because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer. She can now do exercise 
emphasizes that for several years, she wasn't able to do relief factor has been a real game changer for her, her aunt, other members of our family, Mike here in the studio, and for many other people. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of just $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 800-4-RELIEF to find out more about this offer. The number again, 800-4-RELIEF or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. Somehow it seems that when um, Democrats are in office, bad things begin to happen on the global stage. And Debbie was musing about this and also shaking her head this morning. And she's like, the latest business is going on in the Sudan and like, wait till you hear about it. And I was like, you know what? Let's just pick it up right yeah. in our in our roundup. Yeah, well, so as, what's you, up? as you say, no surprise, right? With the Dems, when, when, when our Americans are overseas and in places that are kind of volatile, Bad things happen, okay? Remember Carter. What happened with Carter? The hostages in Iran, okay? Clinton, U.S. And, and, and by the way, people forget the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, oh, of 1979. Carter, Carter was like, I'm surprised. Well. I had no idea. Carter as well. Uh, Clinton, the USS Cole, and all of the embass the the embassies, um, you know, under siege in Africa during Cole, Clinton. Cobar Tower bombing in Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes. And then, of course, Obama and Benghazi. Who can forget that one? I mean, I hope nobody has. But everybody's just talking about Biden, Biden, Biden. I'm like, guys, Biden has a record because that's his that that's kind of his party. His that's team the, is known for this their, kind of stuff. Their MO. So the latest, basically. Well, let's remind people yes. with Biden, there was the Afghan withdrawal. People are falling right. out of planes. What I find remarkable is that when uh, Lloyd Austin, uh, when Anthony Blinken, when these guys go up before the cameras or they're questioned by Congress, they act like they did a great job. They're like, we don't have any regrets. We don't we didn't really screw up. We didn't make a mess of it. So it's bad enough when you create a disaster. It's a whole other thing when, when you, you lie about it and you and have you, this uh, brazen indifference. To yeah, it. yeah, no, absolutely. And and of course, you know, they uh, they left all the Americans in Afghanistan. They the 13, to this day. the 13 um, uh service members that were that were killed by the Taliban. Well, uh, according to the news, it was ISIS that killed them. Right. And then the Taliban uh, strike on ISIS was kind of like, oh, yes, we got the we got the killers. Right. Because they're the ones that, that killed our 13. But it is worth reminding people of the U.S. gunnery um, uh, sniper who went before Congress and said, listen, we had this guy in our sights. We requested permission from the Biden Defense Department to take this guy out. It would have prevented the bombing. We never got the clearance. In fact, they said not to use force until we were ordered to do so. So in that sense, we missed this opportunity uh, and it's heartbreaking. I mean, imagine being one of the families of those 13 service members yeah. and, and hearing this, that yeah. they, they had this guy, they could have stopped it. And they didn't. And they didn't. Um, no, absolutely. This, like I said, this is a pattern. But, uh, but so the Biden administration though applauds the Taliban for for uh, striking the ISIS, right? Well, but but here's the thing, ISIS. I mean, the Taliban doesn't care about Americans. They didn't. They didn't kill the ISIS member because to of help the us. to help us. No, it's it's a strife going on between them. It's a territorial fight that they've been doing, right? So they don't care about Americans, but oh yeah, very good job, very good job. And okay, so besides that, the US claims the Sudan is too dangerous to evacuate Americans. But get this, the rest of the world doesn't feel the same. For example, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, Spain, and other countries have evacuated their citizens. So this is a what? this is a remarkable change because um, when I think back to when I came to the United States, one of the things that the United States was known for and could be counted on is that if you were a U.S. citizen, you had an added layer of protection. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you were an Indian guy and you're abroad, you're on your own. Something happens to you, don't expect the government to come to your rescue. Even for Europeans, it's like you got to watch yourself because, you know, your government is going to make a determination about whether it's going to use its diplomatic leverage. But with the United States, it was like, listen, if you're an American citizen and somebody tries to kidnap you or grab you or something bad, 
bad happens to you, the U.S. Embassy will be on your side. The Marines will come and get you if they have to. So this was a kind of built-in expectation of what it means to be an American. And it's very clear Those that at least, on, at, well, at least under the Democrats, we can no longer expect this. If you go to a foreign country and you're in danger, you need to look out for yourself. Yeah, so the, the, the U.S. Embassy um, came under scrutiny for using the elite SEAL commandos to evaluate the 70 to evacuate. Embassy, yeah, to evacuate the 70 embassy staff in a helicopter mission, blah, blah, blah. But they won't do that with just U.S. If you're a, U, a normal U.S. citizen, forget it. You're on your own. Um, See, so it says, for those interested in fleeing Sudan, the State Department provided information about available border crossings. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they're basically giving you an information <laughs> sheet. Now, goodness. you know, let's back up. There's a civil war going on in Sudan. It's very bloody and people are being caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. So isn't it amazing? These other countries are like, let's get our citizens out. We don't want them in Sudan. Yeah. So they want to get out. We'll help them get out. But the U.S. is like, basically, here's a brochure. You're on your own. You're on your own. And uh, it must be for the first time, really, I would say since World War II, this lonely feeling of being an American abandoned and in, in dangerous territory abroad. Debbie and I have been eating better this year. We've lost weight, but foods we can't seem to get enough of, and it's a requirement, are veggies and fiber. Now, there's no better way to get all your fruits and veggies plus fiber than with Balance of Nature. Balance of Nature Fiber and Spice right here, it's a proprietary blend of 12 spices for digestive health. The intense flavors and deep colors of spices are the most condensed whole food source of phytonutrition available. It's recommended to be paired with this, their star product, fruits and veggies in a capsule. So easy. Select the whole health system system for the best price. Start your journey to better health right now. Take advantage of Balance of Nature's great offer, $25 off plus free fiber and spice with your first preferred order of fruits and veggies when you use discount code AMERICA. The offer can end at any time, so act now. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751. Or go to balanceofnature.com. Use discount code AMERICA. Debbie and I have been talking about the fate of Americans abroad. We've been focused on the Sudan, where there's a current strife and civil war. But there are also articles that seem now to come with disturbing regularity involving American citizens and really bad things that are happening in Mexico, south of the border. And you've been, you. this is a beat that you've sort of been covering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, and, and this particular story is uh, the resort of Cancun, which we've never been to, but apparently, um, you know, there's, there's about 112 to 114,000 missing Mexican citizens. Okay. Not, not just Amer American citizens do, do go missing and all of that, but the Mexican citizens go missing a lot in Mexico. And apparently they found about t eight bodies, uh, that were discovered over the weekend about 10 miles from one of the one of the nice resorts in Cancun near the airport and apparently um uh, it, this this is kind of a uh, this keeps happening is this cartel it, violence it's cartel violence it keeps happening it's more common uh in other areas of the country than than the resorts but these I mean, are let me read this, this these are resorts people go to americans go drug to drug cartels have begun disposing of bodies of their victims in clandestine body dumping grounds so evidently there's a cartel war they're fighting for control of the drug trade yes, yes. and and the ocean the, the the beach area is apparently a really big drug trade place they, they do, they go by boats and that kind of thing. So they want control of that territory. And if somebody happens to get in the way of their crossfire, too bad, so sad. I mean, sad. I remember, you'll remember this, we were at a very nice resort in Mexico. Actually, this was not, not Cancun, a different part of Mexico. And we were talking to the maid and, oh, yes. uh, and everything seems very safe and it looked like, and people told us, listen, don't hesitate to go to town. No problem. You have tourists milling around. And there were. Uh, and yeah. one day we did go to town and we went to dinner, but Debbie just having a conversation with the maid in the, in the resort. And she goes, Hey, you know, uh, is there a, a cartel presence here in this area? Cause we've been told the cartels really don't like to, they're not going to interfere with some kind of high end tourists. 
And she was like, oh, the cartels are here. She's like, the cartels are very much present. And so it was a little sobering for us oh, because the like, cartels what? may not be visible, but she was saying they're kind of all around you. Oh, yeah. You know, the cartel bosses vacation here. They stay at this resort. They've got investments in the hotel. So this is Mexico. And this is something that obviously if you're a Mexican citizen, I think the Mexican citizens are kind of already on notice. But certainly if you're a U.S. citizen, you need to be aware yeah, of it's not yeah. to say you can't go on a cruise. You can't have a good time in Mexico, but you got to be wary. you got to yeah, kind of keep you your wits to, about you. You have to be careful. Like this says in 2022, two Canadians were killed in Playa del Carmen. A lot of people go there, you know, as, as a vacation. Right. And then in 21, in the town of Tulum, which I hear a lot about, they, they're like, As oh, Tulum is so wonderful. A lovely part of Mexico, yeah, yeah. About 80 miles south of Cancun, two foreign tourists, including one American and one German, were killed when they were caught by gunfire from rival drug dealers. Yikes. So the point here is that the cartels don't have to be going after you. No one yeah. is saying that the cartels wantonly want to shoot tourists and and sub you know sort of spike the Mexican economy. Uh, it's like the cartels recognize that Mexico is dependent to a degree on tourism. The cartels don't want to get in the middle of that, but they don't hesitate. They're so ruthless that when they're fighting each other, yeah. people get caught in the yeah. crossfire. But you know what? If you're thinking this only happens in Mexico, guess what? Not so much. I just saw a story about a demonic MS-13 felon that dismembered a Florida Uber Eats driver before stuffing his remains in a trash bag. That, I, I, I now, almost- Where did this occur? Uh, in Florida. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, no, for no apparent reason, there was no motive behind it. So, apparently this Oscar Solis fellow, and Solis is my, my mom's maiden name. It is. I was uh, just, <laughs> so, anyway, 30 years yeah, old. Yeah, 30 years old. He moved to the Sunshine State in January after being on parole. He was in parole in Indiana. And apparently when this Uber Eats driver went to his house, his name was Randall Cook, 59 years old, he yanked him inside the house and butchered him killed him in cold blood. He was just making his final delivery of the night, and the last thing he texted his wife was to tell her he would come home soon before this happened to him. I mean, how sad his wife was. He was just a guy trying to make a living oh for his my family. Oh, goodness. And um, uh, this is the kind of thing that is so senseless oh. that you don't even quite know how to react to it emotionally. Well, or the good thing, though, is that this is in Florida, and you better believe this guy is never going to see the light of day because they will execute him. He's going to go on death row. There's no way this guy... Look at him. He looks... Uh, I, he looks almost monstrous. He, he looks horrific. And he's got... Uh, Tattoos all over his face. All over the front of his face. I mean, I, there are people who do a tattoo on the back of their neck. This guy has tattoos yeah. that cover his entire Just, bald head, all his cheeks, and then uh, all the way down his neck. Listen, I have, I have advice for Uber Eats drivers or anybody that delivers anything to anybody's house. Just leave it at the door. Don't ring the doorbell. Put it on the on the ground and take, and off. take off. Because had he done that, he probably would still be alive. So, um, I mean, think about it. This guy, Solis, 315 pounds? Ugh. He's a strip club security guard, oh. apparently. So this is a guy who's supposedly oh providing gosh. protection. Uh, but uh, but he's he also a, a repeat, felon. A repeat felon whose rap sheet includes battery resisting arrest and stabbing a fellow inmate in prison was paroled just months ago after serving four years in Indiana for assault and burglary. And he was affiliated with MS-13 in Indiana. So here so. we see also the fruits of Democrat policies, which is to let these guys out. Uh, prisons are too full. Now, it's one thing to say that this guy was convicted of having 10 grams of marijuana. We'll let him out. It's a whole different matter to let a guy like this out who is habituated to violence. Uh, this is his M.O. and is most certainly going to be uh, a threat to, to ordinary citizens and produce I would say heartbreaking tragedies like like this one. In this segment on Christian apologetics, I'm now moving from the exaggerated crimes of religion to the very real and shocking crimes of atheism. Interestingly, secular writers talk endlessly about the crimes of religion, but you never hear about the crimes of atheism. 
uh, 500 years after the Inquisition, we're still talking about it, the Inquisition, uh, but less than uh, three decades uh, since the fall of godless communism, there is an eerie silence about the mass graves of the Soviet uh, gulag. I've been listening in audiobooks to Solzhenitsyn's uh, The Gulag Archipelago, and I'm only at the beginning of it, but what a riveting uh, account. And again, this is not something that is ha it's hardly talked about today. So why the absence of accountability? Does atheism mean never having to say you're sorry? Now, atheist writers who do take up the question uh, will say, yeah, you know, there are atheist um, um, people who do terrible things. And um, but according to Richard Dawkins, quote, what matters is whether atheism systematically influences people to do bad things. There is not the smallest evidence that it does. Wow, what a line. There's not the smallest evidence that atheism encourages people to do hideous evils. I'll, I'll be coming back to that. So here's Dawkins continuing, individual atheists may do evil things, but they don't do evil things in the name of atheism. Wow. <laughs> I'll show that this statement is absurd, flatly untrue, uh, and contradicted by a massive trove of historical evidence. Here's physicist Steven Weinberg, a little more subtle. He goes that, that uh, scientific atheism, quote, has made its own contribution to the world's sorrows. But, he says, where the authority of science has been invoked to justify horrors, it has really been in terms of perversions of science. Very interesting. He's saying that science shouldn't be held responsible because the people who did the bad things, I think he's thinking here of eugenics, of social Darwinism, uh, of forced sterilizations, and so on. Uh, he's saying, uh, well, science can't be held responsible because this was actually a twisting, a perversion, not the true meaning of science. I guess by implication, he's saying that the people who did this in the name of religion were, in fact, following the true meaning of religion. Now, in this section, I'm going to focus on the really big crimes that are committed by atheist groups and atheist governments uh, in the past 100 to 120 years. The most powerful atheist regimes, communist Russia, communist China, Nazi Germany. I mean, these three regimes have wiped out people in astronomical, astronomical numbers. Stalin is known to have been responsible for somewhere between 20 and 30 million deaths, mass slayings, forced labor camps, show trials followed by firing squads, population relocation and starvation, and so on. For a long time, I thought that Stalin's crimes were put him in the sort of numero uno of genocidal maniacs in history, uh, with Hitler being kind of a somewhat distant second, but uh, it turns out that Mao Zedong is actually number one. Stalin is number two, Hitler is number three. I'm relying here on Zhong Chang and John Halliday's authoritative book. It's called Mao, The Unknown Story. It attributes to Mao somewhere between 60 and 70 million deaths. Now, some China scholars think these numbers are a little high, but um, but even their numbers are, are huge and show that Mao is probably the most murderous tyrant in world history. Now, Stalin and Mao's killings, uh, unlike the Crusades, unlike the Thirty Years' War, these are done in peacetime. And not, not only that, but these are atheist tyrants killing their own citizens. Most of the people Mao killed were Chinese. Most of the people Stalin killed were Russian. So Hitler comes in kind of a distant third, around 10 million murders, 6 million of them Jews. Now, I haven't at this point even mentioned or counted the assassinations and slayings ordered by other Soviet dictators. Think about it. It wasn't just Stalin. It all started with Lenin. Then later we had Khrushchev, we had Brezhnev, and so on. I'm leaving all those people out. I haven't even counted the so-called lesser atheist tyrants, Pol Pot, uh, Enver Hoxha, Ceausescu, Fidel Castro, Kim Jong-il. So even these so-called minor despots, they killed a ton of people. Let's look at Pol Pot. He was head, you remember, of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. They ruled Cambodia for four years, 1975 to 1979. And in this four-year period, Pol Pot and his revolutionary regime um, engaged in systematic mass relocations and killings that eliminated approximately one-fifth of the Cambodian population, an estimated 
1.5 to 2 million people. Now, by Stalin standards or Mao standards, this may not seem like a lot, but actually, proportionately, a Pol Pot killed more people, a larger percentage of his own countrymen, than Stalin and Mao killed of theirs. And yet, focusing only on the big three, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, just add it up, you discover that these three atheist regimes in a single century killed more than 100 million people. So notice I'm doing a kind of body count here. The body count of the Crusades plus the Inquisition plus, plus the Salem witch trials. Even if you throw in the 30 years war, those numbers are a fraction. They're tiny compared to the massive casualties produced by atheism. And in subsequent days, we'll look to see if these were just atheist regimes that happened to be atheist or if they were doing their killings as I will argue, in the name of atheism. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.